fiction. Science fiction. Horror. Fantasy. Crime. LGBT. Thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Good on FM Los 102.3 FM Riverside and 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and I'm Al Warren, and I'm delighted to have Mr. Eric Shapiro back for a visit as co-host, as he's been off again for a while. How you doing, Eric? Hey, how you doing, Al? I'm thrilled to be here. I'm good. Well, <laughs> I'm as good as can be. Hey, all things know. being equal, yeah, yeah, you know, it could be worse. And um, that uh, that Killer Queens book series, of course, has been optioned now. It's uh, yeah. I want to ask you about that. So, are we allowed to talk freely about it? Um, well, you know, I don't know how much, but I can just say that they've um, they've optioned it and they want to make a series of it, and so I'm all for it. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. So we'll see what they have to do. A, want to do a six part series. Oh, wow. Okay. So, you got to get in there as the showrunner. Just to call the shots. You get that bigger salary? No. <laughs> um, you're going to be hands off? Um, well, they're sort of mixed about that. One producer is interested in having me hands on, and one's not so much. So, oh, okay. um, you know, uh, I am really flexible. I am yeah, really- you are. You are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's um, since you told me the title, Killer Queens, I always thought that was a classic, and I'm so glad it's going in that direction. That should be a TV show. Yeah, so we'll see where it goes. But like I said, well, and I and I have to do Sundance in uh, about three weeks. I I'm doing a four part for the Killing Game book I did years back. So oh, you mean the Sundance Channel? Yeah. Oh, okay, so not not the festival, but it's the same company. You know, same company, and they they want to do a four part docu on it and have oh. me in it, but not as a host, just as a talking head. Talking head, yeah. So oh, that's really exciting. So you have a lot of stuff coming up. Yeah, a lot of stuff coming up, and and I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Travel. I'm not looking for traveling, but yeah, <laughs> if, if, if it's to a good destination. Yeah, just as you know, I don't want anybody any nut jobs on the plane. That's all. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, so let's get into the show today. Now we've got um, man sitting here waiting. So um, he's written a lot of really interesting books. You know, I saw a savage breed and a few others out there. So and, uh, let's get him on here. So Mr. Patrick C. Harrison, the third, welcome to the show. Hey guys. Thank you for having me, Alan. That sounds like you got some exciting stuff coming up. I'm actually working on screenplays at the moment too. So that's really cool. That Yeah. yeah I, I, I think that's really interesting. I've done a few little episodes before and stuff of things and, this is kind of something new to me, uh, having them do a series on books. That's kind of, uh, um, it's kind of thrilling, but it's kind of not, you know. Um, I, I like the attention, but I don't. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I hear you. I, I was just kind of approached out of the blue by a guy who had read my Splatter Western. He's a director, like an indie director here in Texas. And he said, hey, would you be interested in writing a screenplay for a horror Western? And I was like, oh, my. That's something I'd never done before, but um, that's something I'm tackling right now. So it's a, it's a new experience for me. Too. Oh, nice. Are you working with Final Draft? Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, how's that? I found when I first started on Final Draft, it clicked. And I'm usually not good at things like this, but it clicked for me in about 20 minutes. I, I really like that. Yeah, it's, it makes it real simple. I remember years ago thinking about writing screenplays, and I was just trying to do it through Word. And it was so complicated to get the formatting correct through Word. It was just... It was too much to tackle. Oh, you, you said but, it. Yeah, yeah. And um, also for, uh, transferring from one person's system to another word is going to lose formatting and it's going to change the pages. So, yeah, Final Snap yeah. is a really good program. And um, you, yeah. can, you can always tell with your eye now if it hasn't been written in Final Draft, it's become the standard. Right. Yeah, it sure has. It's a really great app for anybody planning to do that sort of thing, for sure. Um, how you, how's the adaptation going? So you're adapting your own book. Is it a novel or a novella? Uh, yeah, I'm actually not not adapting my book. Okay. I'm kind of doing a, an original screenplay. Oh, but okay. the guy had read my book. Uh, oh, got it. But he was looking for something a little different. So that you know, I'm kind of coming up with the story along the way. I've actually thought about maybe 
turning it into a novella or a novel after I'm done with the screen. God, okay, but this is, um, you're writing in your style, which encompasses horror and bizarro, and it's intense and colorful and so forth. Yeah, for sure. It's a lot of blood and guts, a lot of, you know, there's, I'm not going to divert the viewer's eyes from the, the gory stuff, you know what oh, I mean? Oh, nice, That's okay. Kind of what I call my, my style of fiction is full contact fiction. <laughs> when you when you read my stuff, if there's if there's a kill scene coming, I'm not going to just you know glaze over it. You know, it's going to be full on brutal. Uh, same with the sex scenes. You yeah. know, just don't divert the reader's eyes from the stuff that's you know really meaningful in the story. Yeah, I uh, got you. Okay, and it's interesting. You walked by saying meaningful to the, to the story. You walked me to the next question, which is what is what is it that's exciting about the sort of eros and thanatos, the sex and violence part of it? Um, what, what is it that uh, gives it uh, flavor. And, you know, I think at uh, this day and age, it's, it's almost like whenever I was growing up, that wasn't the sort of thing you found in, in fiction. Okay. And, you know, it wasn't until I, I read a, a few of the stories of Clive Barker in books of blood where I was just blown away. Like, Oh my gosh, this guy, he tells everything, you know what I mean? He, he shows all the blood and gory details and, it's really different. For, you know, Stephen King occasionally goes there. Uh, Dean Koontz never goes there, okay, yeah. you know. But then, yeah, I read Clive Barker, and then I progressed and read some Edward Lee and uh, some of these guys that call themselves extreme horror and splatterpunk and guys yeah. like that. And over the last year, it's really blown up because of uh, some of these books going viral on TikTok. Um, like, for instance, my... My company, Death Said Press, we published a book called Dead Inside by Chandler Morrison, which is very, uh, very graphic, uh, definitely extreme horror. And it was read by someone on TikTok. And, you know, they're talking all about it, how it was just so graphic they couldn't finish it. And all of a sudden, we didn't know this video had been made. And all of a sudden, sales just skyrocketed. We're like, what in the world happened here? And that's happened to several of these extreme horror splatterpunk authors over the last year. And I don't know why people have gotten this fascination uh, to that genre. If it's just they haven't seen it before, if they want to test their own limits. And same for authors. Are authors trying to see how far they can go and get away with it? Are they trying to test their own limits? I'm not real sure. I've written some of that myself. I don't consider myself necessarily an extreme horror splatterpunk author, but I've written in that genre. Um, but yeah, it just seems like something that both authors and readers are kind of connecting with right now. Right. It gives it a certain excitement. It makes it, there's an aliveness, it's an openness, it's not, it's not BSing the reader, that sort of stuff. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I guess that's a good way to say it. They, they don't, like with Dean Koontz, when somebody dies, I love Dean Koontz. He's great. I consider him more of a suspense author than a horror author, but Whenever you're reading him, when somebody dies, okay, they die, fine. But you don't see how bad it is, okay. you know, whereas if you read Edward Lee, oh, God, you're seeing all the details. You cringe, you know, you feel sick to your stomach. It's a different experience. Right. Was uh, Jack Ketchum, uh, was he considered splatterpunk, or would that be a fair characterization? Or he different? Um, yeah, I would definitely say he's in that realm. Especially with like off season, yeah. a lot of people refer to Girl Next Door as as that genre too. That is just oh my gosh, that is one of those stories that it's not necessarily gory. It's just so messed up, and it's a slow burn. You can just see it coming the whole way, and you're like, why is nobody doing anything about this? You know? Yeah, yeah, that book, but, The Girl Next Door, is I think like one of the greatest examples of sustained tension and suspense i've ever seen it's just like like it slow oh, builds no and doubt. builds and builds and the level of dread and uh definitely a work of art yeah yeah it, it's a difficult read because it's just so you can see it coming from a mile away but you're like you're thinking surely somebody's going to stop this right on. right it just it never gets it's relentless stopped. yeah and, it's, it's really and you also we just had dean coons on about a month ago and you were correct i mean he is a suspense guy I'm wondering when you're doing your work, which uh, whichever way you categorize it, it, it's more extreme. Is suspense important to the way you're structuring the the story to have that build, or not necessarily? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, 
I wouldn't consider myself a master at, at building suspense. I, I have a friend, Chris Miller, who I consider one of the best at doing that. But um, depending on the story, on, on what I'm going for, I write a lot of short fiction. Okay. And it's really hard to capture suspense in, in short stories. Um, you're, you're kind of just maybe playing with one scene or a couple of scenes or something like that. But definitely when I've written my long words, like with The Savage Breed, and my first novel, Inferno Bound and the Hellhound, kind of build upon one scene after another to, to build that suspense for the reader. But also, you know, with the level of gore and violence in mind, it probably it might hinder that suspense a little. I'm not sure. It's probably a better question for readers. But you definitely want to have uh, the suspense in there because you don't want your reader looking away. You know what I mean? You want them, oh, I, I just got to read the next chapter. So having the, the end of each chapter, you know, be hanging or what's going to happen next, that going through your, your reader's mind. So they'll just keep turning the page. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. That is an interesting balance between the suspense, which is more the build up and the promise of what's to come and around the corner versus the more extreme elements, which are also very visceral and tangible. And they, they, those things can kind of compete with each other. And I found that I was just discussing Breaking Bad uh, with a friend earlier, which is one of the most suspenseful shows. It's so so much suspense all the way across. Although, and I, I think it's a masterful yeah. show. I wouldn't take anything away from it. Although, in reflection, having watched it a few years ago, I sort of think like, yeah, sometimes if suspense is the main ingredient in the engine, there is a need for other elements too. Um, it's it's yeah. a balance, yeah. Because if you're if something is just built to wind you up, you might go back and see it a second time and be like, well, I saw everything I needed to see because. Now I know the outcome, and it's not suspenseful anymore. So having the, you know, that infusion of the yeah. sex and violence, I mean, there are different ingredients to play with. Right. Yeah, it's funny you should bring up Breaking Bad. I actually just started. Oh, okay. Watching. I'm like through the first, th- first three three episodes, and it it already it already has me captured. That's a it's a great oh show. nice yeah yeah and it gets better and better. It really it really goes to phenomenal heights. Um, so. I'm curious about your screenplay. Is there is there a target length? Is it going to be 90 minutes? Do you are you economizing it with a length in mind, or how's that process working? Um, I'm shooting for just over 100. Okay. I guess that's kind of what I read is like a good good length for uh, page okay. camera movies. I, I'm about I think like between 50 and 60 pages right now. Um, the director who approached me, he didn't really say one way or another how long he wanted. He just kind of outlined a few themes that he was looking for. And, but yeah, I'm thinking, I mean, what is it? If it's just over a hundred pages, don't, don't they say that kind of goes to like 90 uh, minutes? Yeah, you're right. I mean, it usually is a minute a page. And, and it's interesting how strong that rule holds. Uh, when I've directed things, it's typically a minute a page. And uh, my wife is an actor, and when she's acted in things, I'll, she'll bring the script home, it'll be 84 pages, and then a year later, we'll see an 84-minute movie. So it's pretty amazing. Unless, oh, yeah, wow. it's pretty, that whole, so you, you would have like an hour 40. Um, unless you have voiceover, that changes the equation, because then you have pages where the voiceover and the images are sharing space, so each page will not right, be right. as a result. So that, yeah. Um, but, um, okay, so are, are you finding your, the, is your passion curving more toward movies? Is there the hope that that'll take off, or are you still, or are you going to be ride or die with fiction? With uh, Oh, I, I'll for sure be ride or die with fiction. Now, if, if I'm actually working on another screenplay as well, it's a TV series, okay. but if, if those take off, you know, that's going to be awesome, and I would, I would totally do that full time if it paid, yeah. but my passion, my love is with fiction. It's just, it's a more, uh, you know, it's a, it's a way of storytelling that you're connecting with your reader a lot more than you would through screenplay. Um, it's just a different experience. Um, and I can't see myself ever fully going towards screenplays. It's just, yeah, writing fiction is just absolutely the thing I love. God, there's more immersion. It's more of a full blown thing. I mean, it's all there. Yeah, for sure. I was going to say, but from from a guy that's never done that, um, what what is it that you hope to get out of a screenplay? What is it that's different that comes out of a screenplay that isn't in the fiction, or vice versa? Like, kind of where you both have done this. So, what 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 is the um, element that changes things? For me, on a 
on an intellectual level, it's learning a new craft, you know, is, is a really neat experience. Um, but like I said, I was approached out of the blue and had never written a screenplay at all. And then I started this other little project myself just because I was enjoying this other one so much, you know. So I'm enjoying learning about screenplays. Uh, I'm enjoying that intellectual process of, of learning as I go. But, you know, the connection you get with your readers through fiction, I think, is uh, preferable to me. Um, I guess what I hope to get out of writing screenplays is money, man. That's what I want to get out of screenplays. I want, I want, to, <laughs> I want to get something option to make some money off of <laughs> <laughs> I prefer um, I prefer writing screenplays because I have no patience. So it's just it's just dialogue and action. So it's like bang 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 bang. I'm just like flying and manic. Yeah, I, um, I was but, shocked at how quickly I could go through stuff in screenplays. I didn't realize you could do it that quickly. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And you know, if you think about it, like in terms of words per page, it's usually I think with the script somewhere in the realm of 150 a page versus in a double space page of prose, it's like 250. So if you're an experienced prose writer, when you turn to a script, it's like heaven. It's like, oh, wow. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I can draft a script in a week, and then people think I'm rushing it or I'm, like, acting crazy. But it's like, no, I can't. I would be faking it if I went any slower. You know, I would at least have a good, you know, like, raw draft to at least start with to revise um, and do, what, like 15, 16 pages a day. It's not, it's not a big yeah, deal. Well, so. I, I remember watching a Roger Corman documentary, and he was talking about writing a screenplay in a weekend. And I was like, what? You can write a screenplay yeah. in a weekend? <laughs> and then, you know, I started doing it. It's like, you know, it, if I sat here for 12 hours a day, I probably could write a screenplay in a weekend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no question. And there's also, like, the audience hit, like, the way it goes from the script to screen. Like, if it was written in a more sustained fashion with momentum – uh, I think the audience in the back, even though it'll, of course, be revised and rewritten before it gets shot, the audience will kind of feel that sort of rollicking momentum that was carrying you. Like in so many movies, like Rocky was written in three days. I know Cabin in the Woods was written in three days. There are tons of them. I think uh, Kevin Smith's movie Red State, yeah, like 30, 30 some odd pages a day. And uh, yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. And uh, um, But everybody's different in terms of temperament, metabolism. So there are all these variables. Right, right. When you write a book, like when you wrote Savage Breed, um, what were you hoping the reader would take away with that? You know, with the Savage Breed, it, it was an idea I had for years and years. And originally, it was going to be like a, a Western vampire novel. That's not what it ultimately turned out being. But um, it was this idea I had. And I decided I wanted to finally tackle it. And at the time... Um, I just started my publishing company, Death Said Press, with my friend Jared Barbie. And I told him, not telling him about my book idea for a savage breed, but I, I told him I had this idea to start a series of books um, of horror westerns. And I said, I wanted to call it a splatter western. And he said, okay, well, let's do it. And so we reached out to several authors. I think it was originally it was eight authors. And we started this. We said, hey, we're, we're doing this series of splatter westerns. It's going to be a combination of uh, violent horror with Old West uh, style prose, you know. And so we got these eight authors on board. And I really, at the time we, we put this, started putting this series together, I hadn't thought any further about my story other than it's going to be a Western vampire story. And, you know, we started getting these other authors tackling it. And, okay, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, I better get to work on my novel. And I started writing it. It, it just took a complete 180 from what I was going to. It, vampires no longer existed in it. Uh, it turned out to be more of a creature feature novel. And I started writing it, and there's this lead character named Crow, who's an escaped outlaw. And as I was writing it, I was thinking, you know, this guy, I don't think he's very likable with the readers. I need to come up with a character that readers are going to love. And so I came up with this character. Her name is Liz Sawyer in the book. And I started writing her about a quarter of the way in. And she really took over the novel. And she became my favorite character. And repeatedly in reviews, she's the one that 
uh, readers are connecting with and they love. She's just, she's this like 15 or 16 year old girl that just has a smart mouth and does all sorts of absurd things. And uh, you find out later on, she's probably a serial killer too. And so it was weird going in because I had one plan to write this vampire novel as part of a series that I basically created for this novel. And before I was halfway through, I'd completely changed my book to be about this girl and and the tri- trials and tribulations she goes through and the messed up things she does. And, you know, what I was expecting to, to give the readers from the get-go, get-go was just, you know, an exciting story that, like I said, combined gore and Old West stuff. And I did that, but I also created a character that I was not expecting uh, so many readers to connect with. And, you know, I'm looking down the road, and I'm probably going to have to bring her back because I've had so many readers reach out to me through private message and email and even in reviews saying, hey, we got to see something more from Liz. So I think whenever you start a novel, you're, you might have one expectation of what you're delivering to readers, but then once you get to the conclusion of it, you give them something completely different. It, it sounds like it, it was so you wouldn't classify the outcome as a western, even though there's there's elements of the west. Or how did that part end up? Oh, it's it's definitely a western, but I think um, the you know the western is just the set. You know what I mean? Uh, you have outlaws, you have sheriffs, you have forces, you have beautiful landscape, everything you see in like a Louis Lamour, Zane Gray, Max Brand uh, type thing. But you also have uh, monsters flying in the sky. You have um, a little girl who does a lot of effed up stuff. Uh, maybe she cannibalizes somebody. Maybe not. I don't know. You'll have to read it to find out. <laughs> but um, I would still say it's very much a Western, but it's also very much a horror. And and that's how we came. You know, that's a, a splatter Western is what it's called. And when does it take place? Uh, if I remember right, it's 1886. Okay. So you're more of a pantser than a plotter, as they say. It sounds like you discovered a lot of it. Well, I was with that one. I'm actually working on a novel now that because it encompasses so much and it's going to be so long that I needed to plot it out a little bit ahead of time. Um, Usually up until this point, yeah, I've just kind of had an idea. I start writing and wherever it goes, it goes. But um, I'm not opposed to... Uh, writing out outlines. I've actually found it for my current experience in particular to be very helpful. Where where do you come up with your characters like Crow? Like how does that, how does that develop? Like who is Crow? So you never really find out exactly who Crow is. Crow was basically just the, the guy when I originally started, he was going to be the guy to experience all these horrors. You know, I had to have someone experience it. Um, he's kind of a, a drifter uh, in the Old West. He's had several occupations. He just happened to fall in with this band of outlaws. And in the beginning of a savage breed, he's they're about to he's about to be executed uh, along with the rest of his band. And then you know some things take place and he escapes. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of thought into who Crow was. He just turned out to be a character. Um, that I, I didn't love as much as I should have for a lead character. That's kind of how I started thinking and Liz Sawyer came in about. Now with her, I had, I had recently seen the movie and read the book, True Grit. I don't know if y'all, if y'all have watched that or not or read the book. Yeah, a couple of versions. But <laughs> I kind of took inspiration from Maddie from True Grit and used her to, uh, to inspire me for Liz, except Liz is uh, far more sadistic and evil. Maddie's obviously a good character, character in True Grit, but she's got a real sharp tongue, and she's fun to listen to. And you see her kind of wrapping all these other characters around her finger in the book and the movie. The, the latest movie, by the way, is, I think, the better adaptation than the John Wayne movie. But um, so Maddie from True Grit was kind of the inspiration for Liz, but I just kind of took it a thousand feet further. And, you know, that was, that was kind of how I developed her character. How do you do um, your style of writing? What's your structure? 
Um, you sit down for a certain period of time and have to have everybody out of the room, or can it be noisy, or do you have to have it be a certain mood? What? How does that work for you? Yeah, I, I probably prefer quiet, but whenever you have a family, <laughs> you don't you don't get it a lot of the time. I've learned, it, especially when I'm in a groove. If you know, if I'm writing and I'm in a groove, it doesn't matter if there's a tornado outside, I can still write. But yeah, especially when I'm struggling, having quiet is definitely preferable. But like I said, yeah, you're not always going to get that with the family. You're going to have a thousand questions coming at you. You're going to say, you're going to hear, you know, I need something for breakfast. Would you take out the trash? Would you do this? Would you do that? Mm-hmm. And, you know, there might be TV shows in the background. So I'll play music every now and again, too. But I've found that I can write basically in any environment when I'm rolling. You know, when that when the moods really hit and the words are really flowing, it doesn't matter uh, where I'm at, what I'm, what's going on around me, it'll happen. Uh, you go into kind of like a trance. Yeah, you really do. And, you know, I'd heard an interview with Chuck Polanyi where he was saying he'll go sit in the middle of an airport or in the middle of a mall and just write because the people walking around and the people talking and all that going on actually fuels um, some of his creativeness his creativity yeah. and I can, I can, I, I don't generally write out in public like that, but I can definitely see that happen. You know, your environment does influence what's going through your head. So I can see that. working. Do you do a lot of editing? Uh, do you have like an average number of drafts you find yourself doing? I really edit along the way. Generally, whenever okay. um, I'm writing, whenever I sit down for the day, I'll read several, I'll start reading several pages before where I'm at. So I'll edit as I'm going. Uh, I don't generally do more drafts because when I'm done with the story, it's like, okay, I am done with this story. And, you know, I'll send it off to my editor. And of course, then I'll address whatever they say. But uh, as an editor myself, I generally hate the edits of other people. (laughs) (laughs) But it's, it's, it's tough to navigate. Yeah. You, you never know what's coming at you. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. But yeah, I've had a couple of times where um, editors have basically tried to rewrite my manuscripts. And I'm like, oh, oh, sure. I will not be using this person again. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, that's tough. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't, um, because it's a fine art of being able to bring out the author's voice yeah. and accentu- accentuate what's there. And uh, I always talk about shiatsu, like shiatsu points. And hitting the pressure points when I'm editing, like it should be, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go in very light and lean and I'm going to try and find the simplest, most minimal way to enhance it. If it even needs to be enhanced as opposed to like, Oh, we have to paint over everything. Right. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's just a good way to piss off the author. You know, I mean, sure. some authors, they do need some guidance in, in their writing, but Oh, sure. You know, whenever you're dealing with authors who have been, published numerous times and have seen success to try and rewrite something they wrote in that manner is it's really it's just an insult honestly oh no no question about it yeah it also sounds like from the way you're describing your writing um the way you capture it and you do it in different environments and you rewrite as you go it seems like the emotion is one of the most important parts of what you're doing so i would imagine that if an, an editor comes in with too heavy a hand there's the threat of that emotion drying up like you wanted to get from, you know, your keyboard to the reader and have a certain spontaneity. Is that accurate? Yeah, whenever I have an idea when I'm, when I'm writing it, how I want it to flow, how I want the characters to connect, how I want certain things described. Um, whenever I send it, and I'm not insulting any editors. I mean, a, a lot of editors see success in doing, doing it the way they do that. But whenever, whenever I write it and go back through I'm satisfied with the flow and the character development and the descriptions. Really what I look for and the edits people do for me is more, more like proofreading type stuff or inaccuracies or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, sure. And yeah, that's kind of how I approach, you know, I, I probably make more money editing right now than I do writing. And that's kind of how I approach my editing. It's like, I don't want to take the writer's style away. Um, yeah. You know, I will, Definitely proofread off correct grammatical errors and 
being someone I, I, I know I have a vast knowledge of like uh, uh, firearms and weaponry and um, uh, human anatomy and physiology, physiology just pay, based on uh, on careers I've, I've worked in. And so that really helps me in the horror genre. So I'll make corrections for, you know, OK, this gun doesn't operate that way or. Okay, if somebody got cut here, they wouldn't bleed that way, or maybe they would bleed more, you know, something like that. So, but I definitely don't attack anybody's style. I think that's just a way to never work with that author again. Yeah, yeah. Well, what what careers did you work in then that that give you all the knowledge? Oh, about I, I, kill, killing killing people. Or? <laughs> I, was, I was I was an RN for ten years, and um, and then I I worked in the firearm business for three years i was i sold it i live in texas and in case your listeners don't realize that we have gun shows every weekend like all <laughs> over the place so i was a i was a gun salesman so <laughs> wow from rn to gun salesman it's interesting <laughs> on the rn side of it it's interesting because uh that, you know number one you sound like a nice guy number two that's a job where there's you know the compassion that you're exuding comes into play so people must be surprised when they hear the sort of fiction you write yeah, probably. But, you know, I've used a lot of my experiences in healthcare in my writing. Uh, I've written mm-hmm. several stories that are based in the healthcare uh, field, but it is so useful in writing gory, messed up narratives because you know the things that happen to the human body when bad, when trauma occurs. Um, yeah, probably. Probably people are uh, surprised, people that I've cared for in the past, which I live in a small town, too. So a lot of people I mm-hmm. cared for, um, they know I write this sort of thing. <laughs> so. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So um, would you would you say, because, you know, when, it, when we're going into these sort of extremes of horror, it can get dark, it can get shocking, but there's also differing levels depending on the author of how much humanity and warmth is there. Would you say your work is like pitch dark, like it's like unrelenting and merciless, or would you say that there is a warmth and a, and a humanity that's undeniable? Yeah, I, I think if you don't have a little bit of warmth and humanity in there, then your reader's not really going to care. They may be in mm-hmm. awe of whatever depravity you're writing about, you know, they may find that exciting in the moment, but they will not care that this is happening to your character or by your character or such as that. So um, characterization is probably the most important thing in fiction, in my opinion, because, um, you know, it's been said a million times. I'm just repeating it. But if the reader doesn't care about your characters, they're not going to care what happens to them. That's very much the truth. So, you know, you your your character can be horrible. They can be like Liz Sawyer from A Savage Breed. They can be like Patrick Bateman from American Psycho. They can be horrible people, but your reader needs to connect to them somehow. I kind of do that through humor and dialogue in A Savage Breed. Uh, Brett Easton Ellis in American Psycho, he does that through all these crazy vignettes where Patrick Bateman is, is talking about music and fashion and all these other things. You just get so caught up in who this person is, and then he does some really messed up stuff. And so, yeah, I definitely think, you know, you call it warmth. I'm not sure warmth, but there needs to be that connection uh, with from the character to the reader for for the bad things that happen to really be meaningful. Do you find that working, because Brett Easton Ellis has been vocal saying that he couldn't get American Psycho published now, and um, do you find that there's less acceptance in the current climate of a characterization that is, you know, that has depravity and there's less of a ability for people to navigate the, um, the duality within a character. I think, I think Brett Easton Ellis is full of shit. How dare you? Uh, you know, he, he, oh, okay. <laughs> he, he might not could get a mainstream publisher to publish it now. If, if he, okay. if he were as new as he was back then, but he could definitely okay. get it published on the indie level because there are, I think there's more uh, depravity and messed up stuff being published now, probably than ever before. Now, where he would probably run into trouble is, if I remember correctly, in in American Psycho, he uses racism several times. And I think that's 
definitely a, a lot more of a hot button topic now than it was then. And I think he might even get pushed back in the indie presses now. Um, but you definitely wouldn't have any problem with like the blood and gore and even like the rape scenes, you know, that's not something that's, um, uncommon in the indie world in extreme horror and spider punk it's, it's kind of going for that shock effect so can, people kind of mm -hmm. expect those very depraved topics when you put humor in, in gory settings and murder and stuff like that um the timing has to be just right uh, what do you do to make sure or sure that it is right or do you care yeah that's kind of tough um it definitely it has to kind of offset the gore so um, kind of the way I did it in a savage breed is this Liz Sawyer, my character, she'll be doing something super messed up. Um, perhaps maybe if you read the book, um, maybe severing someone's arm off and eating it. Maybe she does that, maybe she doesn't. But as she's doing all this, she's talking to her horse like it's another person and talking about the situation and saying all these absurd things. And um, if I was successful in doing this, I think it, it added a lightheartedness to that scene. So there's something just so messed up going on, something that should be revolting. But I think the reader is probably laughing more than they're gagging during the scene. You know what I mean? And that's my personal way of going about it. Um, I mentioned Edward Lee earlier. He has very little humor in his, so he definitely doesn't use that approach. When you read his stuff, you're like, oh, my God, this is disgusting. And there's definitely disgusting moments in some of my stuff, too. But I definitely try to offset it with humor because I think there's, those are two elements that the reader uh, will appreciate. They'll, they'll like, you know, that readers like to laugh and have fun. But they also, at least a lot of the readers I know, they like to be shocked and like, I cannot believe he just said that, you know. So I, I think they work well together. I think you draw in more readers by combining the two. Whereas if I was completely serious in writing a very graphic scene, I think I would drive a lot of people away. Um, what is the appeal for you personally of going so extreme? Like, like uh, what drew you to that kind of writing? Uh, you know, I think, it, like I said, kind of in the beginning, the first time I read Clive Barker, not that he's necessarily extreme, but he has extreme elements. I was just shocked. Um, and I've been shocked. I've been shocked by other authors before I started writing it myself. And I was like, I, I felt like that was a really good feeling. Like how far can somebody go? Shocked. Yeah. Um, terrified. You know, you watch some of these movies like, um, necromantic or human centipede or a, a, a Serbian film went a little too far for me, but, <laughs> but you watch some of these I've movies that, that you're like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe they did this. And yeah. for whatever reason, maybe I'm messed up for whatever reason, I enjoy eliciting that response from readers. I want people to be saying, Oh my gosh, I can't believe he just had this happen. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting is when I became, and I'm not in any way uh, judging what you're describing because I can relate to it, but I, I found when I became a dad, which is the past decade now, I've started becoming more gun shy. Like, I, I know exactly the impulse you're talking about. Like, boom, I just went really far. And I, I did it as recently as my most recent novel, which I wrote two years ago. So I'm not saying I've, like, outgrown it. It's nothing like that. But I'm wondering... If you've, because uh, you said you have a family, sometimes kids in the background, I'm wondering if that has led to any um, shift around that one way or the other. Yes, for sure. Um, I've had my kids ask if they can read some of my work, and I've, I've had <laughs> yeah. to say, ah, why don't you wait till you're a little older for that? <laughs> yeah, how old are your kids, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, my oldest is 22, and my youngest is 12, so I have them. You know, obviously, my twenty-two-year-old. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to read, you know, uh, okay. visceral or a savage breed, uh, you go for it. But um, you know, one of my my daughter, uh, my oldest daughter, is very much a Christian and would not approve of the things I am writing. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, whenever 
uh, she has asked to read stuff. I was like, okay, well, let me just tell you what's in this. Because she's old enough now. She's 18. But I, okay. I say, you know, this is what's in this book if you really want to read it. But, you know, here's, a, here's, a, here's another story I wrote. It's in this anthology. It is not extreme. It's not that messy. If you want to read that one, I love that story. I think you'll love it too. So, yeah, it's it's been kind of, I'm not sure what to do. You know what I mean? I'm not I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not um I'm not ashamed of the stuff I write, but at the same time I don't want to say, all right, kids, check out this really messed up stuff I've written. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting. Yeah, because my my father actually wrote a couple books and he, then he hired me to help with the editing. And it was interesting, it was nothing too extreme, but there were things in there that were sexual and perverted and shocking. Yeah. And it was interesting because I actually felt like it was a side of him I, I couldn't know any oh, other way. Sure. I felt like I understood him more. So there was something there. But, um, yeah, that's a tricky one. I also felt it was like biochemical. When I guess when men become dads, you have less testosterone <laughs> because your body, your, your body switches into child care, right? So, like, uh, and it's a subtle thing. But I was also like, huh, I wonder, like, for whatever reason, I don't feel as revved up to, like, smash the audience between the eyes as I used to, but then part of me feels like, oh no, I'm getting weak. Yeah. Like, so I don't know. It's a tough one to navigate. It's a tough one to navigate. Man, I am right there with you, and I totally see what you mean about seeing another side of your dad. That's that's exactly yeah, yeah. how I feel in my own right. I'm like, man, if they read this, they're going to see a completely different side of me than they know. You know, okay. Yeah. Which would probably, I think, would be a good thing. I don't know, but I'm not coming at it from like a religious lens. Or, right, yeah. right. It's yes. a person, you know? Yeah, I mean. I guess you have to look at it like it's fiction, okay? I'm, I'm still right. the I'm I'm still the good person. I would never do in obviously any of these things that are in the book. It's just yeah. fiction, you know. You kind of have to look at it that way. I guess. Yeah, it's a it's and that brings me to another thing I want to ask you about the the concept of it being cathartic because, like you said, it's fiction, so that means it's free. Yeah, it's a zone in which you're free to express whatever insane thing you want to, and that's. That's what I've always loved about doing it. It's like, you know, rather than be an unintegrated person and be insane in your personal life, like those elements of your humanity have a safe spot, um, for lack of a, another way of saying it, to uh, show up in fiction. So um, I'm curious if you find it cathartic to go to those extremes. Like, it's like, okay, this is good. Like, you can get like sort of uh, dark or difficult emotions processed, or is it not really, does it not really take on that shape? You know, I, I've heard people say um, they take their their darkness, their anger out on the page and that sort of yeah. thing. That's really not how I've ever done it, at least not okay. uh, consciously. Mm -hmm. I can see that maybe unconsciously. Maybe that is the case. I don't know. But that's never been my intent going in. Um, for whatever reason, that's just kind of the aspects of fi fiction I've always enjoyed. And so I enjoy writing it that way, too. Um, I guess it, you know, who knows? Maybe there is some sort of um, mental mending going on as I, I write these awful things. Maybe it's uh, taking care of some past uh, traumas I've been through. Who, who knows? But um, when I go into it, I don't generally feel it as uh, like a cathartic experience. I'm just kind of thinking about, okay, what would make the reader laugh? What would make them cringe? And that's what I'm trying to do. I don't really think of it that way. But like I said, it, it could be uh, some underlying thing. You really don't know what your mind is doing under the surface. Yeah. It sounds like the way you're describing it, all in all, it sounds like an exploration. Like it sounds like you are coming at it like almost like from a sporting standpoint, like it's an expedition. We're going to see how far we can go what territory we can go to, whether it's horror or humor or both. Oh, yeah. Sure. It's like, yeah, so the exploration is exciting. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, that, that kind of goes with, um, you were talking earlier about whether I uh, outline or just kind of shoot from the hip. And definitely when yeah. you shoot from the hip like that, it's just, if, if you have the intent of, okay, I'm going to start writing, let's see how far this goes. Um, if you're in the right state of mind, if you're rolling good, something crazy is going to come out. You know what I mean? Right, right. It's your subconscious. Enough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So are you um, getting people, neighbors, and people that you really don't like or someone that cuts you off, do you put them in your book and kill them? 
<laughs> Actually, it seems to be exactly what he was just. Fun. I'm I'm more inclined <laughs> to put you in and kill you if I know you and am friends with you. Right, but right. Um, it, you know what's funny? It's like an honorarium. You know what's funny? I I've thrown a, I've thrown around the idea of offering up my services to people to write short stories where they kill people or do awful that things. That is a brilliant idea. Yeah. <laughs> about, That's yeah. a good business model. Oh, you just said that in front of 150,000 no, people. <laughs> you better start the business tomorrow. Yeah. You better that get on very, it. I think you get a lot of customers. I, That's I really brilliant. think that would be a cool idea. Um, I'm not. There's probably been people that have done it before, but, I mean, how cool would it be to be that, that guy you hate at work for you to have him have his testicles ripped off by a tentacled creature in a short story. You know what I mean? That'd right. be awesome. It's well, it's well written. It's professional. It's custom. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you, I've made over the years, like I, I've made a living as a ghostwriter. It is, it's just one door down what you're describing. It's like the per the client in that case has a story. Uh, I'm here to help them write it. It's like in this case, the client wants revenge and a fantasy. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's a good idea. I don't think I've ever encountered that concept. Yeah, I, you know. I think it, I, it might be yeah. lucrative. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll give it a try. Um, how do you, so how do you like to uh, navigate with social media and websites and stuff? What, what do you like to use for interactions with readers? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> I, am, I am not a fan of social media. I kind of do it grudgingly. Um, as the co-owner and editor-in-chief of a publishing company i have to do it you know what i mean we have yeah. uh facebook and twitter and instagram and all that jazz personally i only have facebook and i just recently started a, an instagram and i've posted maybe 10 pictures or something like that i'm i just started a tiktok channel i have three videos i don't i don't know where that's going to go but so many authors are having success by using tiktok i'm really pressure to start using that a little more but i i would have to make it unique you know what i mean i don't want to sit there and do goofy stuff or uh, dance around in a thong or some crap like that but um, <laughs> yeah I, I was um i was wondering about you with social media before uh i'll ask the question because i find the social media environment curves so hardcore toward like virtue signaling and like everything being light and fluffy. So I was wondering, I was like, yeah, how would one behave in that environment if the product is, is dark and it's challenging? It's like, it might not even be the ideal place to find your audience. Yeah, that's a good point. I know, I know on Facebook, which I'm most active on, I've kind of become immersed in this little clique of authors. And okay. basically nothing you say is out of bounds. You know, you can, Oh, that's you can say all these absurd things and, you know, you promote your fiction that is just over the top. Um, but whenever you get out in the, in the mainstream audience, you know, that's probably a different story. But, you know, it, to be a successful author or publishing company, you have to reach that mainstream audience. So that's kind of where you're walking a thin line. Um, you kind of have right. to determine, OK, you know, can I post this? Absurd mean that everyone in my uh, friend group would laugh at, but, you know, half the country would be like, are you insane? What is wrong with you? for You know what I mean? You said it. That's the dissonance with the whole exactly. thing. Exactly. Yeah, you can't win. So what, what is your website so people can find you? So my personal website is pc3horror.com. And if you want to see my publishing company's website, deathsheadpress.com. Fantastic. Of course, we'll have that up on our website so people can uh, find you with one click. If they can't remember what it is, they'll can click it. You know, how was how was the last couple of years writing for you? Do you find that, um, you know, with all the negativity on the outside of the of your house, so to speak, um, did, does that sort of get you to write darker or how's that work for you? Hmm. You know, I think I was writing pretty dark before the pandemic. I will say this. I think sales have gone sky high since the pandemic. I'm not sure if that has anything to do with it, has anything to do with COVID, or if it just kind of fell in line that way. But with both the, the publishing company and my personal sales, over the last two years, they're far better than the two years previous. Um, maybe it's the readership is embracing 
darker things rather than uh, myself or the company uh, doing further darker art. Um, I think, you know, just like, just like probably during uh, previous eras, during World War II, World War I, I think there was a spike in uh, dystopian type fiction during those times. I think maybe at this time during the COVID pandemic and all the negative things you hear about in the news, uh, maybe people are kind of embracing these darker elements uh, of fiction of their own mind and that sort of thing. Maybe that's why sales have spiked over the last couple of years. I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm glad to benefit from it, obviously, but uh, yeah. I don't yeah. think it's personally well, changed my output. Yeah, it's probably something you're not going to really, really see until when you look back from 10 years. Right. From now, yeah. You kind of look back. You might notice some things, something different. Yeah. Just about the way you you word at things or address things in a book. Yeah, right? it's kind of the thing that uh, historians may look back on and be like, oh, look at this. At, at the same time that COVID went crazy, extreme horror kind of went crazy, too. I wonder if there's a correlation there. <laughs> well, there's something because you got to, you know, when COVID hit, you know, look at the biggest movies that were being streamed were all kind of, you know, the, the old uh, virus type movies. Oh, yeah, for sure. Know. Yeah. You know, it's like a big thing. So my, there must be something about that. So keep keep killing people. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you can. I can guarantee that for sure. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good motto. Where does it go then? What what? So what do you got coming up next? Like, what are you working on now? I mean, there's the screenplays. Yeah, but are you working on another book right I, now? Yeah, you know, I, it's probably something I shouldn't do, but I always have several. Uh, projects going. I should probably focus on one and get it done and move on to the next, but I always have several going. Um, I'm writing a novella right now. It's called Grandpappy, and it is in the extreme horror genre. Um, it's about a guy, young man in his early 20s, who is tasked with taking care of his grandfather who is on hospice. And um, if you've ever seen people on hospice, it's a uh, a horrible thing to see and in this novella horrible things are going to happen um, i'm also working on a novel it's called the snake creek inquisition and this this is going to be my biggest project um up to this point for sure i'm about fifty thousand words into it i expect it'll be somewhere in the range of 120 to 130 thousand words and it is more in line with the mainstream horror but I think it's, uh, at least up to this point, it's the best thing I've ever written. And I think if there's, uh, if anything of mine is ever going to hit big on the, on the mainstream, hit big with sales, I think this may be it. I really feel that. And so I'm, I'm really dedicating a lot of time to that. And then, of course, like you said, I got screenplays going. I'm also, I've been asked to contribute to a couple of, anthology so i'm working on short stories for that um god i'm always writing something i guess well that's good keep keeps your mind going yeah you know keeps you out of, keeps you out of trouble <laughs> <laughs> well maybe not uh <laughs> anyway well it's been a, it's been a real pleasure uh we're, we're glad you could make it um now um the person we're talking about our guest patrick c harrison the third um thanks very much for being on the show hey i appreciate y'all having me this has been a fun show Get the latest news and opinions from Eric Shapiro from the House of Mystery website in the Shapiro Report. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.